the illusion of immortality. So since man, mankind, is mortal, his deepest desire is immortality. And we all long to not die. And as a result, to witness an illusion of immortality can evoke a very deep emotion. Now, written language, that brought man a step in the direction of immortality. We also, we all know uh, Plato, etc. Those people have become quite immortal. <laughs> we still talk about them. So we all long for a piece of immortality. So the written language already brought us a very important step in that direction. Now the invention of sound recording and photography and film brought humanity even further. Um, it gave a much sharper and stronger illusion of immortality. We have an illusion of somebody talking to us. You can see it on a picture, you can even see him moving in a, in, in a film, as if he was still alive. And maybe he's already dead for a long time. But even if he's still alive, you know that if you can see that movie now, you'll be able to see it in many years. And so you'll have, again, that sense of being confronted with a form of immortality. Um, and, and the more real, the more, the better you can almost feel their presence, the more important this, this illusion becomes for you. Um, and and, and it's, it becomes a real striking illusion. So, um, since the emotion of life is, 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 is lies most in sound, we uh, have all our, our non-verbal communication and the sound of the voice and, of course, music, um, there is a big part of the emotion in the audio of all this. So, audio recordings convey the deepest emotions because they offer the most direct emotional illusion of immortality. Now, the more realistic the presentation becomes and the better the emotion is depicted by the artists and the technicians, the greater the impact of the illusion becomes. So, the goal of sound engineering is therefore to get out of the way, to disappear Oh. to disappear, and that's true for live mixing and studio mixing. I, I always tell my students, if they have done a live sound job and somebody comes to them after the show and says, oh, I love the sound quality. It was great sound that you created. I always tell them, please ask them, are you a sound engineer? And if the answer is yes, you say, oh, Thank you, as a colleague. But if he's not a sound engineer, you have to be disappointed. Because the goal is to become invisible. No one notices you. People are only working, are listening to the result of your work, not of the, to the work itself. So if you betray yourself, you've done something wrong. And so the end goal would be to disappear. I, I always welcome my students uh, to, to the Harry Potter Academy because I teach them to become an illusionist. And no one should know what's going on behind the scenes. They will become an illusionist and they create that illusion. And now with the vision I share with you, I know why people are touched so much by that illusion. So, um, if the details de dis distract from that illusion, we now also know why we are striving for perfection. <laughs> because um, the smallest mistakes in the playing of the musicians, the smallest mistakes in the sound of a guitar, the smallest mistakes in the sound quality of the re recording equipment and of the reproduction equipment betray the fact that it's 
uh, not real. The illusion is becoming less, uh, uh, getting less impact to you. Now, um, this, this might be uh, the reason why we put all, all that work <laughs> in developing equipment. Um, and maybe it's just me being enthusiastic about a new vision and maybe next year I think yeah 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 that was a nice view but it's it's different again but there is something here there is something why we are continuously trying to improve the last bits and pieces and it's been brought up in the past uh, uh, talks why can't we just reproduce reality why can't we just put microphones in front of this guitar and we will have the exact same experience? And Guido said, yeah, yeah, but the, the acoustic properties of the guitar are so different that you cannot make a loudspeaker that behaves like that. And maybe if you could, it would not be able to reproduce a trumpet. <laughs> so it might be a good guitar loudspeaker, but for, not unusable for anything else. And then, and then uh, John comes up and says, yeah, I got another guitar, it has, has different acoustic properties. And then, ah, I have to start all over again with my loudspeaker. So it, it's impossible. And then apart from that, uh, the source, an acoustic source like you just heard, uh, it radiates in all directions from this position, different frequencies in different directions. And then if you see what we have, we have two loudspeakers. And the two loudspeakers, they have their own radiation patterns. And the interference of the two gives you the illusion of a guitar being projected in between the two loudspeakers. Um, so it's not the same. But following my, my, my story, I would say it's not so bad that it's not the same because we know deep inside that it, it can't be the same because we know we are mortal. But it, the fact that we are confronted with a glimpse of immortality and the fact that it's, we know, we feel that it's different, but it feels the same at the same time, that makes it so intriguing. So I think that the combination of non-perfectness on the one hand and striving for perfectness on the other side. So making an illusion that everybody will know is not real, but at the same time trying to work on the details, making it as real as possible. That combination is very touching and emotional involving. It must be something like that that keeps us going to work every day <laughs> uh, because it's so it's it's not just the engineering it's of, 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 of the sound engineer who is making the recordings but it's also the engineering of the audio engineers who develop the equipment because the the details that betray the fact that it's an illusion they pop up everywhere and that brings me to the MU2 because the MU2 I should probably have uh, already uh, uh, the th th thought of is a, a sister product of the, uh, the MU1 that has been introduced, th is it three and a half years now? Maybe, yeah, I think three and a half years back. And the MU1 uh, has become very well known as a, a digital music source that works really good with, with third-party DA converters, and in our case, with the LS1 loudspeakers that have digital inputs. Um, the origin of that design was indeed that it should work with the LS1 which has digital input. So we stay in the digital domain and we only go into the analog domain inside the loudspeaker where the DAs are per driver installed. Now, <coughs> um, since many people also use it with a third-party DAC, we knew that again by integrating functions we could set another step. And maybe if you look at the LS1 MU1 system you, and, and, and has li have listened to our stories before, you know that by integrating, we buy freedom. Because if, ultimately we want freedom. Freedom to do the, make the design what we, what we liked to, to make. So by integrating, we buy the freedom. And why do we need the freedom? Because 
all audio is ultimately a, a compromise. And if you have full freedom, you can choose your own compromise. And that's, that's what we're after. We want to be able to make our own choices in selecting the right compromise according to us. Now, we did that with the MU1 if you combined it with the LS1. Now, if you combine the MU1 that has digital outputs only, you, but you don't use it with the LS1, you combine it with any third-party DAC. Um, for those customers who don't have LS1s, who would like to use an analog passive speaker, or maybe an analog active speaker, uh, or passive speaker with, with, uh, with power amps, there, th that's a huge market, so it's a commercial interesting uh, uh, market for us, but it's also, um, it opens different doors than the full integration that we strive for in, in, with the LS1 system. And again, by integrating all the functions, we buy freedom to put the compromise in the right place. So to, to, to sketch now what we integrated in the MU2, it's still, just like the MU1, uh, there's a room core inside. So it's still a, a digital music source, and through Rune you will be able to play uh, local sound files. There's a built-in SSD drive to play uh, NAS files, to play external USB drive files, everything that you know from the MU1. Uh, of course, you can through Rune also hook up to Tidal and Cobus on, uh, on internet streams. So that's, that part is the same as the sister product. Um, there's also still digital inputs on the back. So if you have a CD drive and you love to have the physical disc and to or just cherish a couple of albums and you may, may have ripped them, but once in a while you just want to feel the, 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 the physical object and you want to play it or somebody brings a CD or whatever, you like to play your CDs. Well, you can connect the CD transport on the back. There's also an input for your smart TV. So you can enjoy your, 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 your movies or your television or whatever you're watching um, in, in the living room. You can also watch that through the MU1 and now also with the MU2. So the sound quality of your television will also benefit from that real high quality uh, processing that's inside and I'll come to in a minute. And that's already partly also known from the MU1. Um, and then instead of with the MU1 going into ASEB or SPDIF digital outputs, including the clock, which was the core asset of the MU1, we now enter uh, our own home-built digital to analog converter. It's a discrete design. That's, that's not new. I'll come to, to the design in a minute, but we do it in our own way. And that's because by having the full integration, we buy the freedom to put the compromises in the place that we want to have it. Um, after that DA converter, there is another integration, uh, an element that we integrate, and that's the line amp. Um, because if you, if you would not have a, have a line amp integrated, and we would have a volume control integrated, and somebody has a phono stage or that he has connected to his record player, he would ha need uh, a second um, line amp to hook up his MU2 to and then go to, through a second line amp and then be able to switch between the phono stage and the MU2. So we figured that by integrating the line amp and also an analog volume control, which is relay based, um, we have very high quality line amp possibility as well, and again, a full integration of functions. There's two sets of analog inputs on the back. There's XLRs and, uh, and RCAs, so you can connect uh, whatever you have, a tape recorder maybe, and for sure, of course, uh, phono stages can be connected to the, uh, to the back of the MU2. And then the only thing really that you still need uh, is a pair of power amps or a headphone because you can connect uh, with a 6.3 millimeter jack your whatever headphone 
actually some people said, yeah, but now we have headphones with XLRs. Uh, do you have a solution for that? Well, the line output of the MU1 is, is powerful enough to also drive headphones, headphones from the XLR output. But in general, we would recommend to use the, um, the jack output for headphones. You can easily switch between um, the, um, the power amp and the, the headphones output by, by double clicking the, uh, the uh, it's gonna play. Anyway, by, by double clicking, you click, you switch between phono, uh, the phones, I should say, and, uh, and the, the power amp. Um, <coughs> maybe bef because um, I want to mainly play music from now on, and I'll explain a little bit more about music production as well. But maybe very briefly a few words about the DA converter. I really recommend to read uh, a white paper we wrote about what we call the major DAC technology that's inside the MU2. It can be quite technical, so it's good to read it a couple of times. If, if you have questions about it, please uh, send me an email. I'll be happy to, uh, to answer it to Guido or uh, to our team. Um, <coughs> but uh, very briefly, what we did is we looked at digital to analog converter design and we saw that uh, the majority of designs have certain advantages and certain disadvantages. And they all have, again, a certain compromise. And we looked at all the compromises that were, were taken in the past. Now, very well known is a multi-bit DAC. That's where we all started with. You can still have them around and then they're called NOS DACs, non-oversampling DACs. Um, what's meant with NOS is there is no digital processing going on. Your bits, whatever the source is, go directly into the, the A converter, the multi-bit the A converter, no digital processing whatsoever. And then you go out of it. Now, um, that was not standard with multi-bit DACs. Actually, the first Philips CD player was multi-bit, but already had digital processing. Why, what is it used for? It's used to get rid of the high frequency noise above 22 kilohertz in a CD case. And you can do that with an analog filter, you can do that with a digital filter. Um, the filter has to be so steep that an analog filter have, will have a lot of phase shifts, so you'd rather not do that. And you can make a phase linear filter in the digital domain. So from the start onwards, um, with digital audio in hi-fi, um, through the Philips uh, route at least, and very quickly also after that Sony followed, uh, we are used to digital filtering uh, as, 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 as the, the de facto standard. And that was used in combination with the multi-bit multi DAX, uh, multi-bit yeah, multi format DAX. Now the next, a uh, step that was taken was that people realized that if you have a multi-bit deck that all the bits have to have a certain precision. And actually the most significant bit that gives the biggest step has to be equally precise as the smallest bit that you have. And that's a crazy amount of precision that you need. You had to laser trim the chips after they were produced. Very expensive technology and you could maybe reach 18 bits precision but, well, if everything was right. So very soon to make it more affordable, uh, there was a new technology introduced. Ultimately that led to uh, Philips Bitstream DAX that had just one bit. Now how can you have one bit uh, instead of 16, which were on the disk? Um, you use a technology called oversampling, which means you, 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 you run 64 as many bits as are actually on or samples, I should say, as are actually on the disk. And then you use your digital filter to interpolate, to calculate the in-between lying bits. And because you have such a high sample rate then, you can throw away a couple of bits. That means the noise goes up, but because the sample rate is now so high, you can uh, push down the noise in the audio band and let the noise grow above the audio band. And that's why it's called noise shaping. The total noise stays the same, but you, by noise shaping, you push down the noise in the audio band and the noise goes up 
above it. And by going on and on and on further, you can end up with just one bit that has a lot of noise, and eventually you, you just push it down further and further to achieve the, the needed uh, uh, resolution or, or noise level in the audio band. Now, the one bit uh, solution also had a problem. And the problem is that you now have two calculations that you need to do. One is the noise shaping and the other is the digital filtering. Um, and soon they realized that the noise shaping showed a bit, was a little bit problematic to do that right with one bit. Unfortunately, they found out after the Super Audio CD was, uh, was uh, uh, already um, created, but even before it was released. And, and so the chip manufacturers moved onwards to the next uh, style, but the, 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 the Super Audio CD was limited to that single bit. And single bit uh, 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 DACs can sound real good, but they are not the ultimate answer. Um, so what you see then is that uh, the manufacturers have introduced uh, uh, DACs with slightly more bits. So two bits, three bits, five bits. And that seems to be the current state of affairs. And that's true for DACs in chips, and it's also true for discrete DACs. And then what we figured is where it still goes wrong is in all that digital processing. And we have the digital filtering and we have the noise shaping. With the digital filtering, we already learned with the MU1 that by applying a way more processing power to that and smarter algorithms, you can improve the sound quality of the connected DAC. So that was at least one th side of things that we could incorporate in our discrete DAC by using the MU1 technology of high quality digital filtering. Why did we do digital filtering? Because we added the extra bits and we needed to do the interpolation. So they actually create a lot of the new audio. And the new audio needs, of course, to resemble the original audio as good as possible. And we learned that you need way more resolution to do that right. Um, now the second uh, thing is that noise shaping and the amount of bits, and you can have more bits, but then the calculation of the noise shaper becomes more complex. And so what we did in the MU2 is we were looking for the simplest form of noise shaping that we could make linear without the one bit problems, but not more. Because if we would have the simplest version and then dedicate a lot of processing power to that, the net effect would be that the simple processing becomes, uh, gets very high performance. And in our opinion, you can better have something simple, simple at a very high performance level than something slightly more complex, because with the same processing amount, you then lose precision. And that's where we ended up with our famous 1.5 bit DAC topology. And people think 1.5 bit, I, I don't see how, how that works. Or well, maybe you learned a little bit about it, uh, binary uh, coding. So with one bit, you have two options. And with two bits, you have four options. Now, yeah, with, three bit, uh, with 1.5 bit, you have three options. So it's in between one and two bits. How can you imagine, uh, let's say, if you have uh, like voltage levels, you have zero volt and plus 1.5 volt and minus 1.5 volt. That's three levels. And then you can say, okay, I make a one, a three level DAC. And we can call that one and a half bit. And you need to do some crazy math to make that work, but it's possible. Now we don't do it in the voltage domain, we do it in the time domain. So that means that we have just two voltage levels, but we can vary the length of the pulse width, so to say. So we have a PWM pulse width modulation, also well known from uh, the switch mode amplifiers, etc. And you can do the pulse width modulation with as many bits as you like. Uh, there are uh, competitors that use five bits to define the, the width, the various width of the, of the pulses. We do just one half bit width. <laughs> Why? Because that makes it simpler. And if it's simpler, you need less processing power to do the same, but we apply a lot of processing power and then you do the simple thing at a real very high quality level. 
Now, this is a complex story. Like I said, it's also in the white paper. You can read about the major DAC on our, on our homepage. And uh, in the end, uh, of course, uh, this is all for us engineers. We are trying to find the right compromise and, and try to hit the sweet spot. Uh, maybe we can gain some trust from the dealers and the, and the journalists that we know what we're doing. <laughs> but in the end, it's, uh, it's, it's uh, the, the, the proof of the pudding is in the eating. So how, how does it sound like?